So I'm excited today to talk to you about um, some of our work, some of uh, ongoing work over the years, as well as um, some of the more recent stuff going on in my lab. Let's see, let me hide. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, non-equilibrium fluctuations in two systems. Um, both of them are living, of course. Um, and so, which is the oocyte here, and also the uh, climate ammonia microstomer. And I like to show these little waves here because we have a we have a strong gravity wave presence in our department, and I like to show that uh, we can see some. We get to look at some cool oscillations too. So I want to thank the organizers um, for these fantastic series of talks and all of the speakers as well. It's been really amazing. And especially really great for, for my students being able to be exposed to a lot of this. So for the students, I like to give super brief kind of uh, introduction to my um, pathway. It's always nice to see where people come from. So I started out working in um, the mechanics of neurobiology back in uh, University of Illinois during my undergraduate. Um, and then going on to some stem cell work in, in Germany before zooming inside of the neurons and looking at uh, these vesicle dynamics and a lot of the stochasticity. Then for my postdoc, I went to the uh, Theory Institute and worked mainly on force measurement um, before coming back to the States um, in 2016, where um, I am currently right now, which is Cal State Fullerton, which is a primarily undergraduate institution. We have mostly undergraduates in the master's program. And I have a small army of students working on, uh, on both biological systems as well as synthetic systems. And mainly the synthetic systems were motivated just so that we could cross different scales. Um, and that brings us to today, where I'm going to talk to you about some uh, non-equilibrium fluctuations. And this red thing here is, an, is a force vector that is measured by the optical users um, for a Clematomonas microstomer stuck in the trap. And I'll talk a little bit about that today, as well as with the oocytes. So I don't think that I need to motivate this very much um, for this audience. But the question of why non-equilibrium physics of living systems is so that we can get at the the, the living aspects, so the active aspects. So at this nanometer scale here, we have these uh, molecular motors. And in this example, this is actin. Of course, there's all kinds of things inside the cell that use energy um, that consume ATP or other sources of fuel to drive the system out of equilibrium. Um, this type of activity at this scale drives uh, cellular activity. So you, this is a whole contracting uh, cardiac cell here, which is beating. And if you leave that for long enough, you'll start to get larger scale organizations like this, which is millimeter scale organizations. And the idea is that if you don't have this activity, if you get rid of it, then you lose all of this interesting stuff. So what we're trying to do is focus on trying to extract what this activity is to understand both the physics and the biology of these systems. So that's really what, what drives what we do. And there's many other groups working on this, of course. Um, but so what we try to do is focus on extracting the non-equilibrium fluctuation. Or the, or, and by non-equilibrium, I essentially just mean non-thermal. So we see these across all different scales, like I just mentioned, this beautiful video on the, on the left of microtubules in the, in the liposome. This is not ours. Um, but so looking at the organization from the, from the cytoskeleton scale inside of cells, which, um, which is where we're focusing on uh, here, this is a living oocyte. So what you see is, is actin um, and all these little vesicles like this are, um, are coated in actin. Um, so then the, this is a meshwork that's being driven out of equilibrium by myosin-5 motors. And we're gonna get into those details in a bit. And then um, we also apply similar techniques to understand the the non-equilibrium fluctuations of, uh, of entire organisms here. So this is our Clamidomonas microswimmer stuck in the trap. You can see kind of the, this uh, diffraction is coming from the laser. So we're hanging on to this, this little guy and can't swim away. Um, and what we do is we use rheological techniques. Um, so what's called passive and active microreology um, to quantify uh, the material properties and the active fluctuations. So most of the time, our goal is not to quantify the material properties themselves. We're not so interested in material properties, but we, we characterize them so that we can know what fluctuations to expect at equilibrium. Um, and then we can subtract those off and we can see what's left over. So we can see all the active fluctuations. And applying this to these two systems, we've seen um, in, in the oocyte cytoplasm, we can extract some kinetics, which look like they're related to molecular motor kinetic, uh, kinetics. 
And then also at the at the climate of Monas uh, microtremor level, we we quantify the the forces and we compare this to all the beautiful fluid dynamic studies done, which has been really fun. So in this first part of the story, it's been an ongoing story um, over the years, um, where we're talking about oocytes, uh, mouse oocytes, and the centering of their nucleus. So, so this nucleus gets driven towards the center, um, and this is an important part in developmental uh, in the developmental cycle. And this is a collaboration done with um, with Maryland Relax Group and uh, Maria Almanasi, um, as well as uh, Fred Van Willen's group, um, and this is Etienne. So. Currently at the University of Luxembourg, and, and Maria is at the uh, Collège de France. And overall, the idea um, is that myosin five is driving this nucleus centering, and we were trying to understand how this happens, where this comes from. So, to make a long story short, um, what we found is that the the vesicles inside the cytoplasm. So, so these red things here are vesicles. Um, and they have myosin, they're driven by myosin-5 motors. They're in a large network of, um, of actin. So all of this red stuff here is an interconnected network of actin. And they're fluctuating due to the myosin activity. And what we found was there seems to be a gradient in, in velocity or activity. So near the cortex, so out, out here, you have larger fluctuations than towards the center, which is so smaller fluctuations on the inside. And essentially what we see is that the nucleus just kind of rolls down um, this uh, this potential here and ends up in the center. And so this myosin-5 is what ends up really generating this pushing force. And the interesting thing is, uh, this is a purely mechanical explanation. So of course, the first thing you would ask, well, maybe there's a whole host of other things going on. And surely there are a host of other things going on. But interestingly, um, more recently in uh, Marie Lenz group, um, they injected these oil droplets here and what they found was that anything that you'd inject in would get pushed to the center. So any mechanical object, this is just an inert oil droplet, um, and as long as over a certain size, so there's some size exclusion, but this would get forced towards the center. And so this is kind of a general overall mechanism for, and I use the word non-specific here, for centering any large object <coughs> in the plasma. And so we found this really interesting. And what we wanted to do was to understand the cytoplasm itself and how the cytoplasm would drive this, this motion. So the question is, how do we characterize it? And the idea is here, I'll play this video. And in this video, I want you to focus on um, the fluctuations of the vesicles in the background. Don't worry about where the nucleus is. So this is the nucleus. Don't worry about where that is right now. Focus on all these fluctuations in the background here. And the idea is that imaging alone is not enough to characterize how active these systems are, right? Because on the left here, we have, um, so these are, this has a dynamic active meshwork. Here we got rid of the active meshwork and here there's no motors to drive the network. So we know it's different levels of activity, but a priori by looking at the videos, we can't tell. Because in principle, these could all be experiencing only thermal fluctuations, but this could be water, this could be glycerin, and then this could be gelatin, for instance. So what we need to do is to go in and actually measure what the mechanics are, not because we're super interested in the mechanics themselves, but then we would know what to expect from the thermal fluctuations. So just the motion is not equivalent to cellular activity. So we need to go in and measure what's going on. The way that we do that is we exploit the fluctuation dissipation theorem. I stole this slide from previous mentor, Timo, and who's now in Göttingen. Um, and the idea is now expect, uh, or think about a particle in thermal equilibrium. So this could be a dust particle in a glass of water or a colloid in a thermal bath. And the solvent molecules here are moving spontaneously. The solvent will hit your particle of interest. So this is the particle that you can see. There's a momentum transfer and that causes a fluctuation. And that fluctuation then makes this particle move through the solvent. There's momentum transfer as this particle bumps into the solvent molecules again and has to push them out of the way. So this is the dissipation part. So there's solvent particles hit your colloid, they cause a fluctuation. Your colloid hits the rest of your solvent, which causes a dissipation. Now in thermal equilibrium, this is well-defined and it gives you a relationship between the energy transmitted by the solvents to create this fluctuation and the energy dissipated by the solvent during particle movement. These two things are equivalent in thermal equilibrium. 
And you can write this down relating the imaginary part of the response function to the power spectrum of the position fluctuations. And this is a relation that's often used in passive microbiology, where you would measure this and you would use this equivalency to calculate the uh, response. And this is, of course, related to our familiar video of Brownian motion that we see here. So we use this technique uh, and we use it in conjunction with active and passive microbiology to quantify the non-equilibrium activity. So the way that we do that is we use this approach, which has been used before, and we, we test essentially, I wouldn't say the validity, but how much the fluctuation dissipation theorem is not obeyed in these out of equilibrium systems. And the way that we do that is we measure using, uh, we measure the, well, we measure the left side of this equation and the right side of this equation independently. And then we see if they are equal. So we use optical tweezers, which is shown over here. This is my terrible drawing of, uh, of an oocyte. Um, and so this is a typical optical tweezer system that's used by, by many other people. Um, and the most important thing is that we can do active microbiology as well as passive microbiology. So we measure the two sides of this equation. And by the way, the, the way that we do that for active microbiology is the first measurement we do is a material response where we apply some displacement actually, we measure the force. And then from that, we can get the full response function. So not just the imaginary part, but we can get the full response function. And then as a separate measurement, we do, um, we measure the spontaneous fluctuation of the vesicle and look at the power spectrum of that. And that's essentially related to, to passive microbiology. So here, this, these two things are plotted in this plot here. And what we see is that the response function gives us this lower line here. And then the, uh, the active part, which is the, um, the spontaneous motion, gives us this upper line here. And what we use is we try to take this area in between, extract this information, and see what that can tell us about the system. So that's mainly what we're interested in here. So there's all kinds of calibration involved in this. I'm happy to answer questions about that later. But what we see is that at high frequencies, these two things equal each other. And at lower frequencies, they don't. So FDT is violated. And we use this information to try to extract something from the system. So just to drive that point home, we do two measurements on the exact same particle. So here we have this oscillating particle, which we we're trapping and applying a displacement. From that, we can get the response function. And then separately, we measure the spontaneous fluctuations of a particle. So we calculate the left and the right side independently for the same particle in the same situation. Of course, they can't be done at the same time, but we do them right after another. And we can switch them to make sure that it doesn't make a difference which one we do first. So to make any sense of this, then we turn to modeling then to make any sense of our measurement. So then we, we model the environment. So this is the cytoplasm here as a viscoelastic environment that is characterized by some viscoelastic memory kernel. It's experiencing some local trapping, some local caging stuck in the cytoplasm. And of course there's thermal fluctuations. And then we say we add an active force to this, which this active force we use the simplest model for active force we can think of, which is essentially telegraph noise. And then we say that this active force comes along, which is the right side of this equation here. This is just simply a force balance. Um, the force comes along and rearranges the environment and drives your particle to a new location. So from this approach, you have these equilibrium parameters here. So all these can be measured from your uh, active microbiology. So getting the response function of the system. And then we have these active parts here, which we are extracting from the model. So this is what we don't know. This is some stochastic process here. And from these two coupled equations, so they're coupled because this goes in there, um, we can derive the active force spectrum here. So here we have, again, these blue things are equilibrium properties. So uh, we have two parameters left over. And in actuality, we've already determined one of these, but that's not important right now. But so we have these two fitting parameters, you could say, to fit our active force spectrum, where the data points are, these circles are our are, are measurements. And then this curve here represents this line. And when we do this fitting, we extract uh, these parameters here. And, and we'll, what we can see from these parameters is that they, they tend to line up with what's seen for myosin-5 um, in single molecule measurements. So we can't verify that, of course, these are single molecule measurements because we're just doing measurements in living cells. Um, but these kinetics agree with what's expected from myosin-5. 
And there's another way to write this, to look at this information, which is the Harada-Sasa equality, which I won't go into the details of, but essentially this is the amount of energy dissipated. And if you integrate this, you can estimate the amount of energy dissipated in this process, which is essentially just a measure of the uh, violation of FGT. And here we get this number here, which corresponds to about 20 motors. So it seems like we have roughly 20 motors in the area of these vesicles that are driving their motion. And that's an estimate that we haven't yet been able to verify, but, uh, but it seems it's at least it's a reasonable number. And these other kinetics also correspond to what happens for very close numbers for a single myosin five actually. But so using this, all we've done is doing active and passive microbiology to extract what looks like kinetics of what's happening at close to the molecular scale. And so uh, in my lab, what we did is we tried to apply this technique to another system here, which is um, these micro swimmers, this climate ammonis. And, and again, for the students, I want to point out that I never worked with climate ammonis before. I still don't really know anything about them. Um, but so what we, the way that this worked was uh, I was looking, I set up my lab, I was looking for something to measure. So I went to the Arboretum and pulled stuff out of the pond. And then we found out, I didn't know what these things were. I asked somebody else and then found out that we could start doing controlled experiments and actually ordering them. So I don't claim to be, to know anything about uh, algae or climate biology, but these are our active particles that are stuck in our trap. And we measure them. So here we use a different technique to measure the forces. Again, I'm happy to answer questions about that later, but we use what's called the photon momentum method. We measure the change in the light momentum directly. The reason why we have to do that is because we don't know the index of refraction or the size or anything like that of the climate ammonis. So to get quantitative force measurements, this is the only way that I'm aware of, of how to do it. And so we measure the force fluctuations as a function of time. We can get these very high resolution um, force trajectories here. So by the way, this, this black center here is, and this black data here is for a thermal par particle and the rest of it is for a climate. This is work done by, uh, by my students here, by the way. So Corbin did a lot of these measurements. And then the idea is that we wanna compare the direct force measurements to what's been seen before in, these, uh, in the fluid dynamic states. Because there's been a host of fluid studies done that have been really beautiful. And what they do is they look at the uh, velocity fields uh, that these swimmers generate. Um, and they use models, often stuck with models, to predict the force generation and the power and the efficiency. Um, these experiments are fantastic. They're also very challenging. Um, and high speed imaging is also challenging to extract the very rapid fluctuations. And so, since we're mainly interested in the non equilibrium fluctuations in my group, the, the fast time scale fluctuations, and we decided to apply these optical tweezers. And our question was if, if we measure the force directly, do our results agree with what happens if you look at the fluid uh, dynamics? And luckily, they, they do for the most part. So I'm very happy about that because I had no idea if that was going to work or not. Um, but so by directly measuring the forces, we get a lot of the same quantities. And, and that's what I'm going to tell you bit about today. So here, the first thing we noticed was that the, there's lots of variation in these force fluctuations. So on the left, you're going to see an example. This is actually where I showed you at the very beginning. This is the force vector here as a function of time. And as we play it, you're gonna see these fluctuations. So there's, it is, there's a large oscillation, it's a noisy oscillation, and it also has this rotation. So we see that very complex dynamics, and we also see many different patterns. So uh, we see different patterns, transitions between these patterns and, uh, and identifiable groups, which would be super cool to apply something like machine learning to understand these. At this point, Corbin was the machine and he used his eye to identify uh, these different types of phases. And we're still looking into trying to understand the transitions between them. But what we see, at least at first glance, is that if we look at how this force vector is oscillating back and forth and how that kind of rotates as a function of time, then we get this ro rotation here of the swimmers, which is also consistent with what people have seen in the helical swimming of, of the climbies which was satisfying because this is, this is a lot easier for us to do. Essentially, we measure a force signal and then we just take the um, spectrogram of it and you can see that there's an oscillation of, of these frequencies here. The nice thing about this is you can do a point by point measurement. So every swimmer, you can, you can, you can characterize this and you can characterize this function of time. So as I said, we don't really know what to do with this information yet because we're still looking for ways to characterize this. So we go back and do what we know how to do which is we look at the force fluctuations and we calculate this, the power spectrum of them. So here we see, this is, you could imagine this be the power spectrum of a passive bead or a dead swimmer. They look very much the same. 
And then the power spectrum of a, of a living swimmer, here we have this information here. And again, we want to extract this information to try to understand what's going on. So of course, we again turn to modeling. And this is in collaboration with um, some colleagues in, in math. Um, and so the idea is to include inertia. And that's actually largely because we want to look across certain scales. So in this case, what I'm going to tell you about today is we do throw out the inertia um, for the microscopic scale stuff. Um, but the idea is to explore a couple of different models. So um, some of you may be familiar with the these two models here, which are very common in, in active matter or, or driven particle dynamics. And then we also add one, at least in simulations for now, which is an active beating swimmer because it's pretty obvious that the, the climate modus is swimming. And we take this approach as a single particle approach, again, to see how well it aligns with the, uh, the fluid dynamics approach, which looks at the entire flow field. So our, by simplified model here, I mean that we, we throw out inertia again. So we have our little clammy in the trap. And what we do is we, we calculate the force spectrum again. So then we have this, this lower curve here, which is a passive particle. And then this data up here, which notably the model does not capture these peaks, but I'll talk about that in a second. And so we can derive uh, our, our power spectrum from our equations of motion. And I, I think of this as kind of like a passive rheology of an active system. So luckily we know what the properties would be in, in the thermal fluctuations case, which is here. And then we use this rheology to extract only the activity. So we're interested again in all the stuff in between. So we fit our equation here, where here we have again all the equilibrium properties. So then everything in blue is already determined by our trap um, and, the, and water, because these claimants are just swimming in water. Um, and then we, we're left over with these active parameters, which really is just tau and v naught. So we fit our tau and v naught to, uh, to our power spectrum here. We extract an average v naught, which is the active, uh, or sorry, the average velocity of our, of our active force, which is 38 microns per second, and then a tau of 39 milliseconds. It's a little bit harder to interpret these in, in the context of the swimmer because they're varying a lot over time. But this is significantly lower than you would expect for a single swimming climate monus. But that's because this is also an average over all particles that are also, or particles, clammies, um, that, are, that are also sometimes quiescent. They're not actually swimming. Um, from these, we can do a similar calculation where we estimate the energy dissipated from the Harada-Sasa quality. And we get this number here, which may not mean much at first glance because I have no context for it. But it's moving, this is about 0.1 femtowatts, which is smaller than one would expect for a swimming clammy as from the fluid dynamic studies. So then what we did was we went to go look at individual climbies now. So here, looking at the individual trajectories, so from these trajectories, I'm plotting the time course of what's happening on the left. And we can see that there's lots of variation. So this is the, the work fluctuations uh, experience as, and the work done by friction or heat, you could say. And then this is the integral of that, so the accumulated work. So really, all I want to say about this slide is that looking at these different climbies here, you can see very different amounts of accumulated work um, or heat uh, generation, you could say. And so this allows us a way to, for instance, look at, if we look at uh, D here, this, this is clearly less active and that's this one here. And then if we look at, uh, let's see, E, this one, that's more active, that's this one. And then that's this curve here. So this gives us a way to characterize the individual uh, energy dissipated by these swimmers where uh, here, this, is, this was about, I think, one femtowatt or so, and this one is about uh, 10 femtowatt. So we can start to look at the variation between them. So Wiley, you have three minutes left. OK, great. Thank you. So we see this range here of 1 to 10 femtowatts. And so uh, what we'd like to do next is to kind of characterize how they transition between these different states and see if we can find any patterns there and see how these, uh, these climates are using their energy. And to go back for a second to, uh, to look at how our model did not capture those local oscillations. And surely, if you look at the trajectory level of dynamics, also our model was not predicting what it looked like. Um, so we went back and all we did, we did the simplest thing we could think of, which is we add the oscillations to this active force. Um, and so by adding oscillations, I mean simply adding a sinusoid onto the active Browning particle model. So when we do that, naively, 
we get trajectories that look a lot like the ones we see with the calamities. We have these kind of rosette shapes, and then they're they're spinning about the origin as a function of time. Um, of course, we see oscillations in our forces, but now we get these peaks in both our higher spectrum and our dissipation spectrum, which line up pretty well with at least uh, the very active swimmers, because here we're simulating a very active swimmer. Similarly, the, the fluctuations in the, uh, in the work and the energy dissipated as a function of time, as well as the energy dissipated from the Bravo-Sasser relation uh, lines up surprisingly well. So uh, I'm actually pretty surprised that this works so well. So we're not quite sure why it works so well, because all we did was very naively add this oscillation of active force. But, uh, but it gives us some hope for being able to explore some things computationally to look at trajectory level dynamics, which is something we're very interested in. So with that, I want to say that our take home message is really that we're using rheology to try to extract activity instead of mechanics. So of course we do the rheology to determine the mechanics. And then what we really do is subtract all that out to try to get at only the activity. Um, and so this has been, this is my army of students here. And so they're working on all kinds of different things from biological systems, synthetic, and also modeling. And many of them are applying for PhD programs before, because like I said, or I hope I said at the beginning, primarily undergraduate institution. So then we have uh, many of our students here. So Hunter, Ryan, Sarah, and, uh, and, and, and Anthony are all applying to PhD programs. So keep your eyes open. They're really fantastic students. And I think I'm looking forward to what they see, uh, what they do um, in their next stage. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Wiley, for a great talk. So again, we will ask some questions from the chat right now. So the first, uh, it's actually a comment. So this is from the slide before your fluctuation dissipation theorem slide. So this was with the cytoplasmic skeleton, if you can go back to that. So Sharon Lupkin has a comment that this, what you described there sounds like the Brazil nut effect before the slide. Before this one? This one, this slide. Okay. So I don't know um, if you wanted to comment on her comment. So I don't think I know what the Brazil nut effect is. So maybe we can get to this in the discussion then. Let's move on to the next question then. And this was from Ricard Alert. Uh, and he had a comment on uh, active fluctuations. So why are fluctuations stronger close to the cell edge? Is it because there are more motors in the cortex than in the rest of the cytoplasm? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and don't really know the answer to that. Um, but it seems like pr there's also stuff that's happening at the cortex actually. So like in, so here I'm only drawing the, um, the stuff that's in the middle, but there's also stuff at the cortex. Like there's all kinds of actin and, uh, and myosin two motors, I believe that are in the cortex here. Um, so I don't, uh, so I don't have a good question or a good answer for you there. This is simply what we measured. So we can't really figure out why it could be due to diffusible things. So diffusible, uh, stuff coming from the cortex, but it's uh, it's hard to say. All, all I can say is that we measured it and we think it's there. Mm -hmm. So I, actually, Arvind Chandrasekharan had a rejoinder to a regards uh, question, which was, you know, the stronger fluctuation at the end can also be due to radial actin gradient in the system. Yeah, so uh, that that's a good point. And there is a gradient kind of like, there's a zone here or so where there's some gradient there, but then within, within side, uh, so, which is still a big part of this area here, um, there is no gradient that, that we can identify anyways. That's definitely one of the first things we looked for because, and we also measured the mechanics in terms of radius. So we measured it in concentric circles going out and it was really hard to tell any difference. I mean, within our area, we couldn't tell any difference in mechanics. So it seems like it was all in the activity. Thank you. And then there's a question from Chaitanya and their question is, did you look at the effect of active stress on nucleation? Um, that's a great question. And no, we didn't. In this system, we did not, because it's essentially, it's really, it was hard for us to control anything in the oocytes. So in the oocytes, that was one of the problems with kind of teasing this problem apart, is anything you would do would end up kind of killing them. So the only, um, the, the only manipulations we could do were to completely remove um, the, the filamentous actin or completely remove the myosin motors. It was really hard to control the degree, but that was definitely something that, uh, that we wanted to do. And that's something that the developmental biologists, I think, are working hard on. Okay, 
All right, then there is a question from Dev Shankar Banerjee and Robin's uh, comment on that question. So Dev Shankar's question is, if we wait for PMR after the AMR experiment, do we expect the results to change with waiting time? Um, good question. And I think it depends on how long you wait. Um, so the, what we do is we, we typically, we measure them immediately after each other and we also flip their order to make sure that our active forcing is not, is not hurting the system in any way. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you, for instance, if you just measured PMR or the, the spontaneous fluctuations function of time, um, depending on your system, they will change. In the O sites, they will only change if, if the kind of the stage of the development changes. So they're very stable, which is why it was kind of nice to do the experiments there, besides mm -hmm. the fact that they're kind of like a spherical cow, which is great. Um, but the, but if you, if you do them as a function of time and for instance, cells that are going through the division cycle, you will see changes in both the AMR and the PMR. So it's always important that you do them in very close conjunction to each other. So you can actually compare, um, so that you can use the, the violation. So you have both measurements if I can get through this. So here it's very important that you do these two measurements very close together. So you can actually compare them because they will change the function. Of time. 